Life Point Youth, and welcome to our uh, Wednesday night midweek gathering. It is so good to be with you tonight and, and to be going through our Cross and Grave series that we have been uh, walking through and, and, and uh, kind of dissecting. Uh, we were looking in the Old Testament a couple weeks ago at the prophecies, and then last week we, we actually looked at the predictions of Jesus uh, and his death and how the disciples never really understood the weight of it. Uh, now we are actually in the cross and the grave. I mean, literally the cross and the grave. These are the next two um, series uh, sermons that we're going to be uh, going through. I know a lot of you were probably looking at this series going, cross and the grave, but we're talking about the Old Testament and, and all this stuff. I promise it makes sense. And we, we're going to read through that a little bit today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn uh, to chapter 27 of Matthew. Uh, we're going to start in verse 30, and uh, uh, obviously this story is, is so expansive. Uh, I would encourage you to read the full story if you haven't. Uh, this past Good Friday, this is going to sound a little, uh, I said a little bit, but it's going to sound a lot similar to uh, our Good Friday service that Pastor Mike preached. Uh, I'm going to try to hit it from a different angle, so um, please bear with me, but, but man, this is an incredible story. I know Good Friday was this past week, but... But I still think that, that looking at the significance of the cross and the death of a king in Jesus is really, really uh, important. And that's something that I would love to be able to walk with you guys. So please bear with me, uh, join with me, and, and hopefully we can all get something out of this. I know I have in my, in my studies. As you guys are, are turning there and getting ready, uh, I just kind of would, would want to put something in your, in your head here. I don't know if you have ever worked with construction or worked in any sort of home improvement projects, uh, but there's a significance in prices of tools, right? There's a significance when you go out and you buy a cheap $10 hammer. That's, that's what my parents had gotten me when uh, I moved out here. You know, they, they were like, okay, you need something, so here you go, and they just kind of handed me this hammer. And then you, you, as you get older, uh, as you start uh, uh, working on your own projects, you'll see that, man, it's, it's worth the investment to have really nice tools or, or really nice things. I think uh, this is also extended to certain events. A lot of you guys are either uh, not old enough to remember or you straight up weren't born uh, during 9-11. So this, so this monumental event that changed so much of life, uh, it, 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 it's not really as impactful to you because of not experiencing it or, or not being able to remember it. You know, uh, it, it's, it's very clear, it's very clear that it's hard to understand the significance of an item or, or the significance of an event without either experiencing it or trying it yourself. You know, it's really easy for me to say I don't need a $300 hammer. I'm good with my $10 hammer until I actually have that $300 hammer in my hand and I'm actually using it. I'm going to be able to tell the difference. You know, unless you are sitting around and really contemplating uh, the events of, of, of a tragedy or a monumental event like 9-11, unless you actually are there and you're so uh, uh, just intent on understanding the, the feeling and the emotion behind that, you probably are never going to understand it to the level that, that uh, older people are. You know, I think that, that it's the same way with the cross and the same way with the story of Jesus' crucifixion. And so we kind of walk this through uh, with ourselves and we let it process, we're never going to really understand the significance and all of the weight that was there when Jesus was nailed to the cross. So if you need a little background about where we're at, maybe you, you uh, are, are just following, you stumbled across us, man, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, uh, basically, this is the end of the, the book of Matthew. Uh, this is the end of all of the Gospels. This, this crucifixion is, is towards the end of all of them. But, but in Matthew, Jesus is at the end of his life. All the miracles, all the teachings have, have, have now occurred. They've happened. And here, we're about to read some of the final moments of Jesus' life and some of his final moments of his ministry. And this, on the outside, would seem like some of the weakest and most humiliating moments of Jesus' life. And some, some, some would say rightfully so. I, I agree that these are those. But there's also some power and some significance behind the events that uh, take place that would shape culture forever, that would 
influence the early church and eventually influence us to where I'm able to, to share with you guys and you guys are able to read it freely for yourselves. So there's a lot of significance behind this. I can't wait to go through this with you. If you have your Bibles uh, and you're in chapter 27, you can go to verse 30. Uh, Jesus has just been given over to, uh, to be crucified. They have, uh, the, the, the Jewish people have said, we want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. There was a, it was a, uh, 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 a, um, an event that would allow them to release one prisoner to appease the Jewish people. And they choose Barabbas and they want to crucify Jesus, even though Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. And Barabbas was a murderer. So here, here he's been handed over and the soldiers are in the middle of mocking Jesus. They've, they've put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a robe around his uh, around his uh, back and, and they've put a, a rod in his hand mimicking this, this king that they think uh, they're mocking. And so we're going to start in verse 30. And this is what they said. It says they, that, the, that the guards, they, took, uh, they spit on him and they took the staff from him and struck him on the head again and again. That doesn't sound fun at all. In verse 31, after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes and then they led him away to crucify him in verse 32 as they were going out they made a man from serene named simon and they forced him to carry the cross this came to a place called golgotha which means the place of the school there they offered jesus wine to drink mixed with gall but after tasting it he refused to drink it When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. There's some significance already in just these first few verses that we're going to go over. And and there's some really application uh, points for us to walk through. And that's really where I, wanna, I want to, uh, to land on for this entire time that we have together. And that is let the cross be processed through your own life. Let the process, uh, uh, let the cross process in your own life and, and make sure that you're filtering everything through this experience. You see, the cross had a lot of significance um, in, in, in this culture. This was reserved for Romans only. So already they're, they're breaking law here uh, or breaking tradition because they're putting a Jew up on the cross. But, but, but this was also reserved for the worst of the worst. This was the most despicable of people. This is what the crime was. And those who were, who, who were crucified, and many of you know this, those who were crucified were forced to carry their own cross. And this cross wasn't just something that was like, you know, made out of a couple sticks or whatever. This is about 300 pounds that people would wear on their shoulders uh, as they used that, that, that uh, beam there uh, to, to just, you know, carry it across their shoulders. And if that wasn't enough to carry a 300 pound weight from point A to point B, what they actually did is they added point C's, D, E, F. I mean, they, the, the, the Roman government was so meticulous about creating a route that would allow for one it to to be excruciating on the person because they've already been flogged and beaten and and tortured and mocked and all of these things but but also the route would there would be there to just add on to them it was also there so that people uh, could be able to see they served it as a warning to other people of hey don't mess up because this could be you And, and they made a point so that Everybody who wanted to see whoever was going to carry the cross, whoever was going to be crucified, anyone who wanted to see was going to be able to see. They crafted a route so that that would happen. And then we read in 32 that Simon was, was uh, forced to carry the cross. Some translations say that he was compelled. It's easy when you have Roman guards who uh, are really running a, a, an, authorita- uh, an authoritative state to compel you to do something. <laughs> if somebody's holding a gun to your head, they're going to compel you to, to do something most likely. But here's the cool thing about Simon. There's evidence that his sons were early church leaders and he had no idea of the significance of him carrying Jesus's cross and the significance of that. Man, had he known, had he been a believer at that moment, 
that would have made that, the weight of that cross, I, I imagine, so much easier than what he was probably going through. He was probably looking at that and going, this is crazy. I don't want to do this. This is a, <laughs> a heavy weight. But man, if he had known what he was truly doing, the part that he was playing would have been in- incredible uh, for him. To, it would have been an incredible honor for him to carry that cross. And, and, and this is significant to us because previously in Jesus' teaching in chapter 16, in verse uh, 24 of Matthew, Jesus charges his followers to take up their cross and follow him daily. Now, we talked about how the disciples never really understood what Jesus was saying here. And, and I don't think that they even understood this teaching of the, of the cross. You see, in our culture, it, it, as we read this uh, retrospectively, we kind of sanitized the cross and we made it into a religious symbol that, that we can wear around our necks or we can put a sticker up on our, our hydro flasks or whatever. But, but it's actually an incredibly weighty uh, request from Jesus. It, it, is, it is incredibly, um, it's incredibly uh, solemn. And, 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 and it's not merely just a warning for suffering the way that some people would like to read this. And I believe it too. There's a lot of suffering in carrying your own cross, but, but ultimately what Jesus is saying is, are you going to carry this thing out to the point of death? Are you going to still continue to follow me and continue to, t- to pick up your cross daily and, and, and follow me to the point of dying to yourself each and every day? How would we respond to this in the modern day context if Jesus said, hey, I want you to walk down death row for me? I want you to, to experience all of the pain and all of the heartache and all of the, 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 the torture that, that comes through with, with these horrible lethal punishments. I want you to experience that for me. We would look at it and, and, and there's a lot of weight that comes with it. There's a lot that, that comes when, when uh, a, a cross is, is taken. You see, people who were carrying the cross, especially those who were about to be crucified, a lot of times... They, they picked people out like Simon to, to carry it because the, the people who were being crucified couldn't. But when we grasp that carrying a cross is a one-way trip, it's a one-way trip to, to our, our death, our dying to ourselves, one with, filled with persecution and heartache and, 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 and pain, we really see the power and the weight of our decision to do so. Guys, this is not a bumper sticker feel good saying it's exactly the opposite it's exactly the opposite it's a charge unlike any other charge to pick up our cross and follow Christ daily in the same way that he did after experiencing a flogging experiencing a beating experiencing humiliation and pain we're about to get into that all of this was the experience of taking up the cross it's not something that we should ever look at and take lightly in our lives and I would like to just go ahead and keep reading after they had placed him on the cross and they have the written charge against him we read in 38 two robbers were crucified with him one on his right one on his left those who passed and and hurled in uh, those who passed by hurled insults at them saying and shaking their heads saying you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. And in the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Now, if he wants him for He said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now we read later in one of the other uh, gospels of this encounter that that one of the robbers had with Jesus where he actually is repentant. But here in this account in Matthew, it says both of the robbers were there with him and they heaped insults on Jesus. And this is the other thing that we can grab from this story as we read about the cross and we read about the significance of it. And that is this. 
we have to look at and examine the crowd the same way that Jesus did and the same way that, that we read about. You see, Jesus was literally, he's the personification of, 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 of God and, 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 you know, we read about that and we see that. But here is, is one of the clearest personifications that Jesus could ever make. Here he is literally in the middle of a sinful human race, literally. There are two robbers on his left and on his right. And we even see that criminals, the lowest of the low, the people who actually deserved the punishment of a crucifixion, they even join in on the mockery of Jesus. And we see through, through this section that the crowd began to blaspheme Jesus. They began to blaspheme God himself. The very things that they were mocking Jesus for, the very things that they were hurling insults on were the exact same things that he was, his identity, his very identity that was true. It's, it's crazy to me that you can uh, hurl an insult at somebody that is actually true. I know for me, Anytime people would do that to me, anytime people would say things about me, you know, it, 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 was, it was whatever if, if it was a lie. It, it, it was whatever if it was, um, if it was, you know, just completely bogus. But when they started attacking and trying to, to, to hurl insults at the things that I knew were true about myself, that's when it became, uh, a, a, you know, tough on me. And, and it became a, a, a thing of like, man, this really hurts. You see, they mocked him as a believer in God. They mocked him as a savior. They mocked him as a king. And they even mocked him as the son of God. All of these things were exactly who Jesus was. And they began to smear him. And as they began to smear him, what does he do? He remains silent. And this is the model that we have to follow. That we have to follow when, when people mock or disregard us, or, or hurl, hurl insults at us. You know, I, I remember being in, uh, in eighth grade, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard um, or, or been told, hopefully you have, that you have to watch the crowd that you hang out with. You know, you have to be intentional about who you're hanging out with. You see, when I was in eighth grade, I had a, a lot of friends, and we, you know, we did all sorts of crazy things. We were uh, troublemakers. We were constantly pushing the the uh, the the envelope, and we were just we were just really on the edge of of kind of being delinquents, like just straight up. We were we were crazy. I remember one time, just so you guys can understand what we were doing. One time, we had a school dress code, and we had different color shirts that we could wear that said uh, uh, Owensboro Middle School on them, and you had to wear khakis. Um, on Fridays, you could wear jeans, but you had to wear khakis and then whatever tennis shoes you wanted and socks and things like that. But we decided we were going to protest the school dress code, but still remain in the dress code so that we couldn't get in trouble. So we just turned all of our clothes inside out and wore them like that. Like that's what we were doing in eighth grade. We were, we were constantly pranking people, constantly uh, pushing the envelope in that way. And, and I remember getting my report card for the end of the, uh, the, end of the semester. And on my report card, you know, I had my grades and they were, they were pretty good. And, but there was a note from, from one of my teachers. And it said, Josh needs to pick a better friend group. They're really influencing him. Now, he wrote this on all of our friend group's report cards. This person needs to pick better friends. This person needs to pick better friends. And it's very clear that, that who you are uh, hanging out with, who you surround your, yourself with, it defines who you are, but, and we have to be intentional about it, and, and I don't know if you've ever received that, you know, watch, you know, you are who you hang out with, but Jesus was intentional about how he was seen, who he was hanging out with. It was just completely flipped. You see, Jesus was so intentional about hanging out with the sick and the broken and, and the messed up because he knew that he was the light that they needed. He knew that he could teach them and, and work with them and dine with them and, and do, live life with them. He knew all of these things. He wasn't affected by them, but he was very intentional in how he chose the people who he hung out, who he hung out with. And even, even there's intentionality behind showing Jesus on the cross in the middle of two sinners. 
that personification of, of Jesus being in the middle of, 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 a, of a human sinful world. So as you're reading this and as you're, as you're diving through this story, think of where you find yourself in the crowd. Are you the type who would be mocking him and, and ridiculing him? Are you the type that would, that would be upset and distraught? Or would you be the type that holds on to the truth that he was speaking from the beginning? Because in these moments, it's, it's really tough to look at. And you don't want to miss out on, on what is, is happening and what is, what is, uh, what is uh, occurring that, that you don't, wanna, you don't want to, to, to miss out on those moments. You see, we have to be intentional about being aware of the crowds that we're around, but also remaining who we are and remaining found in the truth, remaining found. And, and Jesus models this through his silence. He could have easily, he could have easily sent legions of angels down to save him. He could have easily started speaking back to them and, and preaching at them and teaching them and probably could have taught them a thing or two in the midst of it. But he remained silent and he just simply did what had to be done for the people and the crowd that was there. I think that the, divi- the diversity of the crowd is also an important thing to look at, that there were men and women, there were rich and poor, there were Jewish and, and non-Jewish uh, and Gentile, there were uh, all sorts of, of different classes, ec- socioeconomic and, and, and genders. Uh, you know, there, was, there were so many d- d- diverse people in this, in this crowd. And once again, personifying everybody and the significance behind having all of those parties around the cross. And in verse, uh, in in chapter uh, 27, continuing on in 45, we see this. It says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some there standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them and ran, got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar and he put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when he cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And this is is an awesome moment here in, in 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from into from top to bottom the earth shook and the rocks split the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people had died were raised to life they came out of the tombs after Jesus's resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many people and this is where I want to end on in, in 54 it says when the centurion the roman guard who is those uh, and those who were with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened They were terrified and explained, surely, surely he was the son of God. You see, you have to carry your cross and you have to be intentional about carrying your cross. You have to look and examine the crowd, not only as you're reading the story, but also looking at how to apply this in your own life. But there's also something else. You have to be aware of the change. You have to be aware of what happens in this story and the significance of it at moving forward. You have to see that, that the temple was, was the holy of holies. That was the place where God's presence dwelled. And at that moment of Jesus' death, it was torn in two from top to bottom by God himself so that we could have a relationship with him forever. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was so monumental in the changing of the atmosphere of how we can function and, and we can live and we can serve God. It, was, it changed everything. Uh, Spurgeon, who, who, Charles Spurgeon, who is a, an amazing theologian, he said this, and, and, it's, and it's really, really uh, a sobering thought and something that I think is, is a great illustration of this. And the temple, the temple it, it, it being shook and the veil being torn was like a woman hearing the news of a shocking crime that, that caused a lot of, uh, uh, caused her to be distraught. You know, if, you, if you've ever seen like movies or something and, and somebody passes away and the cop comes and they like tell the family, like it's, it's an extremely distraught situation. Like, like they're just in so much distress. They don't know what to do. And, 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 and there's, there's, there's just this wailing that happens. 
And this is almost what happens in the, in, in the moments in the temple where there's this wailing of the, of the loss of the Son of God. He's dead. He's, he's died. He's, get, he's given up his spirit. And so there's this just complete distraught uh, nature that, that God exhibits. And he tears the veil so that people could have direct relationship with him. It, it changes everything. We see in the last verse that, uh, that I'm reading here before we get into the burial and, and everything. We, we, you guys can read that. Uh, we'll get into the resurrection next week. But, but, um, but, but where I want to end on is, is the centurion in, in 54. You know, he said, surely he was the son of God. You see, this hardened Roman centurion who probably was involved in all sorts of executions, all sorts of crucifixions, he notices the difference in Jesus' death. He notices and finally proclaims Jesus to be the son of God. Ironically, the only thing that's wrong with this statement is the past tense that he uses. He says he was the son of God. He, had he only known what was going to happen three days later, had he only known what was going to happen, he would still be proclaiming Jesus as the, 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 the son of God in the current tense. But in this moment, there's so much, there's so much that happens. There's so much weight to the cross. There's so much that we can take and we can, we can look at and, and, and apply to our lives there's so much in just these few moments, these last few moments of Jesus' life that completely changed the landscape of everything. So as you guys are moving forward, as you guys are, are reading through this story, as you guys just celebrated Easter and Good Friday, I, I did as well. I want you guys to just be aware of the weight of the cross. Understand that, that, that carrying a cross is, is a task that we're supposed to do, but it's not a, a, a pretty one. It's not one that is very enticing. We have to look at the crowds that we're around and the crowds that, that surround us. And we have to look at them and, and, and not be uh, affected by them and, and, and continue to be intentional about who we are around and, and the picture that it paints. And we have to be aware of the change because if we aren't aware of the change, if they never understood the weight of the veil being torn in that time, then we would have never had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we get to experience today. We would have never had the, the early church uh, fathers who, who went across the nations to, to spread the gospel. We would have never had any of this had they not been aware of the change of, of, of the events of the cross. Man, I love you guys and I, and I thank you so much for spending time with me uh, today. I would like to just close out in prayer and then we have a, a couple of uh, things to, to get to and, and, and everything like that. But, but I, I just want you guys to be aware of the weight of the cross. Understand the weight of the, of the death of Jesus and, and what that did for us and, and how we can look at this and, and apply it to our lives. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, I thank you so much for each and every person who is watching this, each and every person who is uh, listening to, to the words that, that you have given to me, Lord. I pray that you would have your way in, in each and every one of our lives, Lord. Whatever it is that you want from us, we, we pray that we would receive it. Lord, we pray that we would look at this story, we would be able to see all of the different points of application, and we would be able to, to take those and and just live those out each and every day, whether it's examining crowds, whether it's looking at the weight of the cross, whether it's uh, being aware of the change. Lord, we want whatever it is that you have. So Father, I pray for each and every student, each and every family. Lord, all of those who are watching, I pray a blessing over them and I pray that you would just uh, continue to work in this time. We love you and we thank you. We will never forget the weight of the cross and the and the the, the, the significance of what you did as you hung there and you died and you gave up your, your life for us. We're, we're so grateful. We want to live our entire lives in honor of that sacrifice. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, we would just uh, like to, to tell you to like the page if you haven't liked our page. 
Um, get on our Instagram at uh, LP Youth AZ. Check us out. We have a lot of stuff going on. We have a Zoom call on Friday and Tuesday. Uh, uh, every Friday, every Tuesday, we do Zoom calls. Fridays at 12, and then uh, Tuesdays at 2. We just hang out and get on Zoom. It's it's a lot of uh, fun. Please shoot us your email if you would like to be on that list. We just spend about 30, 40 minutes together. It's nothing uh, crazy or time consuming. We also have a couple podcasts that come out towards the back end of the week uh, on Thursday and Friday. Make sure you're checking those out. Life Point Youth audio podcast. That's where you can listen to this sermon. Maybe you're listening to it right now. Um, or the Engaging the Culture podcast that, that I host where we really are just talking about how to function in the craziness and, and, and all of the different things that, that culture will throw at us. You can check that out. Both of them are on Spotify. Uh, and, and we're working on getting uh, Apple for Engaging the Culture, but it's already up on Apple for LifePoint Youth uh, Audio Podcast. You can check those out. We have a lot of really cool things that we're also going to be unveiling as a main church, so be sure to uh, check that out uh, on our main page at LifePoint uh, Church. And you can, uh, you can find that, man. You can find our logo and everything, and you'll see it. Just like that page. Make sure you don't miss anything that we have there. Man, I love you guys so much. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with me. I, will, uh, I look forward to closing out this series next week with the resurrection and the power of that resurrection uh, uh, that we get to experience. And, and I just can't wait uh, to spend that time with you. Thank you so much for listening or watching, and we will see you next week.